I first met Jarius and Jaden in the dark corner of a dimly lit gas station parking lot in the middle of the night. It was a sticky hot summer evening, and after I turned off my car, it felt like it was just me and the thick summer air for miles. It was well after any child's reasonable bedtime, yet here I am to meet these three and eight-year-old brothers for the first time and take them far away to a foster home, hours away from their parents from whom they were just removed. Two women pull up in a car. We shake hands, exchange pleasantries, and then we move the groggy children to my car in borrowed car seats. One woman pulls up Jarius' shirt to show me a port where he receives tubal nutrition. I have no experience with tubal feeding, and he requires regular medication through it, but the women don't know if he's received tonight's dose. A heavy case of baby formula is placed in my trunk, and my car bounces under the new weight. I hear the lid thud shut. Two garbage bags full of clothing are thrown into my passenger seat. The boys rouse and whimper, looking around into the still night. Less than 10 minutes after we meet, our cars are already headed in opposite directions again. With my new precious cargo, I travel over an hour away to take these children to a foster mother's home. I work with her to calm them down and put them to bed. In the morning, the foster mother finds Jarius curled up very tightly on the end of his bed on top of all of the blankets. As the brothers wake up and get acclimated, the foster mother makes another discovery. These black children are terrified of white people, all white people. On top of a middle-of-the-night move, these brothers, who had only known city living, were removed from their parents and placed into the care of two white social workers, who placed them in my care, who drove them far away to stay with a single white woman in her rural home. I first met Shannon when she was having the worst three hours of her life. I'm sitting around a table under fluorescent lighting. Myself and half a dozen other social workers and therapists look on as this mother of three hangs her head and sobs. She says, I love them so much. I just don't think I can do it. I don't have the strength. Her long, tangled brown hair sways as she heaves into the otherwise silent room. Shannon has just been told she's being granted one more chance to stabilize so that her children can come home instead of being separated into different foster homes as they are now. One more rehab stint, one more chance to get and stay clean. Her children's future hangs thick in the air. Beside Shannon sits her boyfriend, who is also her drug dealer. She stays with him, because otherwise she would be homeless and without any form of family. She knows he keeps her addicted. We all know. And so here she finds herself, her children scattered within a 50-mile radius of this room. One person speaks up and mentions that there's a warrant out for the boyfriend's arrest. He makes a hasty exit. None of us are surprised or even acknowledge his leaving. Shannon stares at the table. Her eyes are red from crying. Her hands are twisted up in a Kleenex in her lap. Her therapist gently tries to encourage her, reminding her how many of us are behind her, cheering for her, wanting to see her succeed. We feel the weight of the responsibility of the decision she's about to make. We feel her hopelessness, her fear of failure, and understanding full well the consequences of that failure. It's a bright spring morning. I'm sitting in a straight-backed dining room chair, staring down into the face of a brand new baby girl. I breathe in the wonder of this newborn special needs twin, a little girl whose mother didn't even know she existed beside her brother until just before their premature delivery. Across the room, her brother's in the loving arms of his foster mother, who is feeding him in the very tedious way his special needs require. The Grabers went from a family of four to a family of eight when they took in these special needs twins and their two-year-old special needs siblings. The Grabers can only do this because of logistical and emotional support given from family, friends, and community. In the first few months, an elderly couple from the Grabers' church came over one night a week 
to stay up with the babies and feed them so that the Grabers could get sleep and better care for all the children's needs the next day. The grandma would come over in her muumuu and her slippers, and she would happily stay attentive all night. What an incredible gift to give to a family that is exhausted and stretched. Others brought over meals, mowed the lawn, even offered to babysit so that the foster mother could get a shower and run errands. Yes, you heard me right. So she could take a shower. Because when you're taking care of four children, ages two and under, there's not a second to spare to get away and take a shower unless somebody's helping you. Johan Galtung introduced the world to peace, not just the peace that is the absence of tension, but positive peace, a place where equity and harmony exist. Galtung defines harmony as the ability or willingness to suffer the suffering of others and enjoy the joy of others. Later, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his letters from a Birmingham jail goes on to define positive peace as a presence of justice. There is much injustice that pulls on our energy today. There are many countless worthy causes. Creating harmony in communities, neighborhoods, regionally and globally is the goal of many a nonprofit church and civil servant. But I beg you, consider this. Can we ever consider ourselves a peaceful country when an addicted, loving, single mother's only daily support is her drug-dealing boyfriend? Can we ever consider ourselves a peaceful country when children are removed from their parents in the middle of the night and taken hours away because there's no foster home available in their neighborhood? Can we ever consider ourselves a peaceful country when siblings are separated from each other for weeks, months, years, because no foster family is well enough supported to be able to take in all of those children at the same time? When the wars are lost or won, when the angry voices are quenched, when enemies become allies, there is still work to be done. My children grew up in expensive car seats with the highest safety ratings. They have not only clean clothes, but too many clothes, and yet another set of clothes just for dress up. I monitor not just their scholastic progression, but their emotional reaction to peers and their sense of self-worth. And while I'm doing this parenting, down the street, there's a young woman in her 14th foster home. A young woman who grew up and borrowed in filthy car seats. A young woman who has no reason to believe that the adults who smile at her when she first walks through their door are actually willing to walk with her as she processes her painful past. A young woman who fully understands people and places get paid to take care of her. Our collective children are not commodities. They are not resource suckers. Our children deserve justice, the best care, not just physical needs met, but mental, emotional, scholastic, spiritual. Our children deserve the best care, not because of what they may become or what they may one day be able to give back. Our children deserve the best because they have inherent worth. They are worthy because they are here. Their behaviors, their words, their medical needs, the size of their families, these things do not always make them easy to care for or love or seem worthy of our best. But it is not his job to seem worthy of our best. It is our job to see the injustice and do something about it. Our country will experience positive peace when a motivated mother can reach out and find connection in her community and doesn't have to depend on a drug dealer for housing and family. Our country will experience positive peace when there are safe and stable foster homes available in every type of neighborhood and community. Our country will experience positive peace when children from hard places and big sibling groups are able to be placed together in one foster home because that foster family is abundantly supported by family, friends, and community. I dream of a world where children are not exchanged in dark corners of gas station parking lots. I dream of a world where essential connections are made and hope is restored to those who hide in shame among us.
where those who have extend mercy and flexibility. Your skills, your talents, your aspirations, your experiences, your personality is needed. And maybe, just maybe, someday you'll be able to tell your grandchildren, I was there, I stood up, I was counted among the peacemakers in my community, in my neighborhood. Thank you.